Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Word on the Snakevine. I'm your host Ross Deacon and in, the, in this podcast we talk all about things venomous animal related. From venom research, venomous animal husbandry, animal conservation, herping and of course snake bite and snake bite initiatives from all around this world. On this episode I've joining me as my co-host. Hi I'm Ed and before we start I have to do a few formalities. Any views expressed in this episode are the views of the guests and the hosts, not the facilities or company they work for. So today we have joining us... Tom McPherson. So today is Tom's first episode joining us. He is uh, one of the hosts on, on World of the Snake Vine. He is a... Well, he, he's a hobbyist with a, with a keen interest in, ven- in venomous reptiles. Um, he's also laid up at the minute with a broken shoulder which uh, is an interesting story we may go into in a probably in a bit of a later episode but today we have joining us uh, Jordan de Bono uh, from this is where I've got to get it right the University of Brisbane yeah. University of Queensland <laughs> University of Queensland in Brisbane in Brisbane uh, in Brisbane uh, so Jordan, Jordan's joining us today to talk a little bit about her research that she's currently doing, some research she's done in the past, and also to talk about women in sciences and how how women and younger generations can get into science uh, and some of the work that she's been doing around that, and to also talk about uh, the the woman in science winning um, STEM. But, I'll spit my words out in a second. I always lose my words in the intros for some weird reason. So she's also going to talk about women in science and winning of the STEM competition award in 2017 as well a little bit. Um, she's an absolutely incredible woman, very inspirational. So we're really, really excited to have you on the show. Um, so I think we'll first start off. We'll first start off with uh, Jordan. Just kind of, how did you get into venomous research and into talk into venomous reptiles or venomous animals? Yeah, um, it's a bit of a weird story. Thanks for having me, by the way. Um, For everyone who's listening over in the UK, it's actually late at night over here in Australia and very, very hot, so a bit of a flip. But, um, yeah, no, so with with my way into research and my way into venomous research, I I studied at the University of Queensland for my undergraduate degree, which was a Bachelor in Science majoring in zoology. And... Part of that degree um, was made up of field trips and one of the field trips we actually went to Fraser Island and for those of you who don't know what Fraser Island is, it's the largest sand island in the world which is actually situated not that far from Brisbane, about six hours north and um, one of the one of can the just, supervisors... Can I just stop you? You just said not far from, <laughs> not far from Brisbane, six hours north. That, that's a long yeah. way. In the UK, we see that oh. as a long way. Australia <laughs> <laughs> is a big country. You can drive for hours and hours and hours and not get anywhere. Um, but yeah, no, six hours for us is not that far. Um, and yeah, so one of the one of the supervisors um, or one of the one of the professors on that field trip, who was a late fill-in, was actually Associate Professor Brian Fry, and I met him. Um, on on the island in one of the field trips and uh, I was in my second year so 2012 and uh, after the week-long field trip he which had nothing to do with venomous reptiles at all it was all about um, ecology and the making up of the sand island and how it's unique and why it exists so at the end of that um that week he he put it out there to everyone who wants to volunteer in my lab i've got a couple of spiders scorpions and centipedes that need cleaning and feeding and um i jumped at the opportunity i thought that was really cool and get my hands on some um alive organisms and yeah so i I started off in his lab got inducted and fed the little critters for about six months looked after them um, so at the time he was doing a scorpion project, so he needed to regularly milk these scorpions. Um, same with the centipedes. And after that, that period of time, he saw that I was diligent and enthusiastic and just keen and eager to learn more about the lab environment and about the actual research that he was conducting. And he said, did you want to stay on for a summer project? And I thought, yep, this is amazing. I get extra credit and it's my opportunity to actually 
put my my time to good use in a lab laboratory environment um, outside of you know the the lab sort of practicals that we have during our degree and and I just I thrived and I, th I thought it was just absolutely incredible that I was doing real research which was going to have some real impact and I, um, I ended up staying there for two semesters just volunteering my time in the lab which resulted in my name on a paper so actually having my name on a real scientific paper was extraordinary for me I thought it was just the best thing ever that I'd actually sort of made it as a scientist and um, yeah we formed a good relationship from then on in so I remained volunteering until the end of my bachelor's degree in the lab just helping out on different projects um, building my skills up so it was completely different to what I was doing during my undergraduate practical hours um, actually using what I'd learnt in theory and um, yeah learning all about venoms and venomous creatures and where they come from and the evolution behind it and how venom has evolved and how venom works in the body and all these different things that I mean I would never have been able to get any knowledge of um, and from the person who is one of the best venomous researchers in the world and I had no idea who he was at the time I didn't really realize how lucky I was um, and then yeah so I graduated from my bachelor's in mid 2014 and I got offered to do an honors um, degree in his lab so Brian was offering me to do an actual project and keep me on in the lab which uh, for those of you who don't know an honors degree is just an extra 12 months of just research which you can tack on to the end of your bachelor's degree some bachelors have it already included but uh, with science you can choose to have it or not have it um, so yeah I, I did that stayed on for another 12 months you know really solidified my position in the lab um, took on more of a leadership role started uh, training up new people and new undergraduates who were volunteering and that eventually led on to a PhD so um, I was able to uh, win a scholarship to stay in the lab and work with Brian on um, on my current projects that I'm doing during my PhD and and it's just gone from there it's it's I, I didn't sort of set out to do venomous research I didn't even know venomous research was a thing um, I, I just wanted to do some sort of research in some scientific field and I was just always fascinated about the the white lab coats and the blue gloves and the glasses and and that's just how it, how it eventuated so and here I, I am um, seven years later I'm still in in the venom evolution lab at the University of Queensland under the supervision of Brian Fry and um, yeah absolutely loving it I've I've, it turns out that I'm actually good at what I do and I've got a passion for it and I'm a good science communicator and um, it's sort of evolved through my PhD that I've become this uh, what people have quote unquote said that I'm inspirational and um, that their children look up to me and that I have a, a gift for explaining science and distilling science and actually communicating it effectively and I think it's through Brian's guidance and also his passion and, and enthusiasm for what he does and his love of it, um, yeah. that it really, it rubs off on you as a, as a student. And if you've got that drive and that momentum and, and that diligence, then it's just inevitable that, that it's going to happen to you as well. So I've sort of taken that opportunity and just run with it. Um, and yeah, as, as a PhD student, you... The, the best thing that you can do as well as publishing papers is also winning grants and awards and getting your name out there and adding to your CV or your resume all the time, you know, whether it be through science communication talks or through radio interviews or through winning awards and going overseas and doing, um, talking at international conferences and so on and so forth. That That's just all come with um, building that confidence um, through the lab that I've been involved in so yeah it's a bit, bit of a weird weird way of getting into this current research um, it's a question that I get asked often because, we, because there's so many people out there that are already super enthusiastic about reptiles and venomous snakes and, and really want to get into the research 
but they just have no way or they don't really understand of how they should get into it. Whereas me, I just sort of took an opportunity and sort of fell into it almost. I think and that's I mean, if, probably it, the most, sorry to interrupt you, but I think that's probably no, the, right. most, the most pony and put the po- potent point of what you've just said is kind of, you went into this wanting to be a scientist, not wanting to be a scientist in venomous research. I think yeah. people try and pigeonhole themselves too much from the start and miss opportunities because they're not going into it with an open mind like you did where you kind of went oh there's an opportunity to work with scorpions and spiders and such forth and kind of that's cool because yeah. you've got an interest, general interest in animals and that that that's cool because you got to do that but then that led on to where the position you're in now and yeah and that's I a mean, great if story someone had a, yeah if someone had told me this you know three four five years ago that I'd be where I am at the moment and I'd be doing what I'm doing at the moment and have done everything that I've done to date, I would have been like, no, no way. Like, I cannot see that happening at all. Because at the time, I was also volunteering in two other laboratories, in physiology laboratories, working with saltwater crocodiles and diving experiments and um, taking care of green tree frogs with the chytrid fungus experiment. So chytrid fungus is a a type of fungus that affects the slothing rate of amphibians and that we were using green tree frogs as a a model organism um, because it's a tropical disease that that is now being found in areas that it was never never found before because of the change in climate change and things like that. So these naive populations of amphibians are unfortunately um, dying out and are already endangered but becoming extinct. So... It was, it was that interest already in science, but also science with animals, um, but also the research behind it. And I had grand plans of becoming a geneticist and working on breast cancer, um, but that didn't really work out. And it was just an opportunity. I, I was all about volunteering my time and just building that resume and just saying yes to everything. And I was working extremely hard. Like I had very little... Um, downtime I was working three jobs at the same time trying to um, pay rent and um, put food on the table and yeah I was very very busy Um, but I saw this as a as a very important thing to put my time into and I don't think if I had have been that enthusiastic or that diligent or you know asking questions all the time and, and getting Brian's opinion and making sure that I was in his face um, so to speak, that I would be where I am today. It was just one of those things that right place, right time, um, and it's just it's roller coasted into what it is today. And I mean, I'm, I'm I'm having an interview with you guys over in the UK, which is really cool. Skype's an amazing thing. <laughs> so, see, um, just backing up a bit, you went on about Brian Fry and obviously him being your um, your mentor. Um, I recently watched one of his uh, talks he did for Bridge Science on YouTube, and I, and I also thought he was one of these people that were great scientific communicators, like Brian Cox, example, for example. And um, one thing I wanted to understand is, is what what is he actually like to work with? What is he like as a mentor? Is he just as great as as teaching his science as he is as commu- as teaching you how to be a communicator as well? Yeah, definitely. Brian has one speed, and that's just go, go, go. Um, but he, you have to be like that to be in the position that he is in. There are plenty of other scientists that are in the same positions because of the sacrifices that they've made, because of their constant enthusiasm, because of their constant drives. I mean, if you... If you don't have that, you don't win grants. If you don't have that ability to communicate, you don't get your science out there, then you don't win grants. And if you don't win grants, you don't have the funding to do the science that you're so passionate about and you've literally dedicated your entire life to. And I mean, that, that lifestyle is not for everyone. Um, and and those people, unfortunately, won't be the professors. You know, they won't be the heads of labs because it's it's just it's just that type of environment. Um, but yeah, he he's absolutely brilliant. I mean, his mind and the way it works is absolutely fascinating. And it's it's constantly like I'll wake up of a morning and I'll have 10 emails that he sent at 3 a.m. in the morning just because 
he had an idea and he needed to get it out onto paper and get that that message sent. Um, and I mean, he's not expecting us to reply at 3 a.m., but those, those ideas are then, you know, already generated. And by the time I wake up, he's already sort of moved on to the next idea. And that's just the way it is. I mean, it, that's how you he works and that's how you've sort of got to operate with him. Um, but at the same time, he's extremely understanding. And if you're, if you're upfront and honest and um, sort of on the same page, then you can communicate and, and work through things and he's open to ideas. Um, but yeah, he's the way he presents himself and the way he communicates through these different types of talks and that enthusiasm and that passion is what keeps us in the lab and everyone who's in the lab agrees on that. It's if you're having a bad day and you know your results aren't working or you're having trouble troubleshooting something or you can't get that last paragraph out or you're just having a shit day pretty much he he can come in and re and reignite that that enthusiasm and that, that passion and really make you think oh you know that this is why I'm here this is why I'm doing what I'm doing this is why I enjoy what I do and this is why I sacrifice so much time um but that that's how he is all the time um but, I mean, if he wasn't like that, then he wouldn't be where he is today. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, I actually, I've recently just finished one of his books, actually. It, it, that even comes across in his books, that that, that is kind of how he is and, and, and that, which is which is great that you're saying that is actually how he is in real life. So, yeah, it, it's good to do that. It's, it's like a, it's almost like a, um, like a whirlwind. Like the definition of a whirlwind when he comes in through lab or comes in through the PhD offices, um, it's yeah, you come in, talk to you about a million things, and then leave again, and you sort of just got to process what that conversation that just happened type thing. Um, but yeah, it definitely comes through his writing, um, it comes through his, his speech, his, his talks that he gives, um, I mean, even his radio interviews or his. TV interviews. It's it's actually really inspiring as a scientist. And and as you say, like you're now being thought of more and more within the community of of, of being in that same ilk of, of quite an inspirational person within within science. I think that a lot of the, the work that you're doing and the kind of the outreach that you, you're doing is is opening up a lot of doors for a lot of people. And, and I think that's one of the great things about it. So it's definitely the, the main reason we wanted to get you get you on the show is to kind of, yes, to talk about your work, but to kind of allow you to tell your story and kind of, mm. and the inspiration that that's driven you so that other people of younger generations can go, hang on a minute, that that's really, if, if you can yeah. do it and, and that, that why can't I do it? Why can't I go away and do it? And I think you... The way you explain things is it makes it easy to to understand, and it's kind of yeah. getting your story out there is going to help loads of different people as well. Well, yeah, like um, it took me a long time to sort of be okay with that word inspirational because I just see myself as I'm just doing what I'm doing, and I'm just doing what I enjoy pretty much. Like. I was never the ducks of the school. I never got the best marks in school. Like I had to have maths tutoring just to pass year 12 maths. Um, but what got me through school and what got me through university was that that dedication and that hard work and that, that want and that drive. Like I've been knocked down so many times and had to pick myself back up. But it, it's, it creates resilience. And I think it also comes from my my strong sporting background like I've always been a swimmer and I did triathlon all through high school and that I think that re real individualistic sport and you know no one else is going to be able to do that for you you have to do it for yourself and it's the same with getting through academia and, and through life like no one's going to be able to do that for you and eventually you're going to have to be able to do it for yourself so if you've got enough want and if you've got enough drive then you can make anything happen. Um, nothing ha was handed to me on a silver platter. I had to work very, very hard to get where I am today. Um, you know, I wasn't 
finishing with the best marks in university, but I was doing something that I enjoyed and I know that I'm not the smartest person in the room, but it's, I play to my other strengths and it's only now, you know, 10 years after leaving school that things are starting to fall in place and that things are actually starting to make sense. And, um, all of that hard work is finally getting rewarded, so to speak. So when I go and speak to school groups about what it is that I do and, and, and science and things like that, it's, I, I, I tell them, you know, I'm straight with them. I'm, I'm honest with them. And I think that they can relate a lot more to that as opposed to their teacher or someone who's so much more older than them telling them the, the, the same messages. It just seems so far fetched. It's, they just zone out. But if it's someone who's quite relatable and not necessarily similar in age, but, you know, might, might have a similar background, um, didn't have the same privileges or things like that, then I think that also helps with, with my communication and the way how I'm able to get certain key messages across because I don't seem, I, I hope that I don't come across with sort of putting myself above them. I try and put myself on the same level as them and um, I, I think, I like to think that I'm quite down to earth with with the way I conduct myself. So, you know, it's been a hard slog, but it's worth it in the end. And if you find something that you're passionate about, and I didn't necessarily know that Venom Research was going to be it, it could be, it could, it could have been cancer research in the end. Um, it's, it's just the way that things have worked out and I have no idea where it's going to take me, but that's the journey, you know, taking those opportunities and just running with them. Um, turns out that I'm good at what I do and I enjoy what I do, which is even more important. So that's, that's the other message I try, and, I try and give people is if you're not enjoying what you're doing, don't do it. It's not worth it. It's, there's so much more good and um, you, you're going to get so much more benefit out of doing something you enjoy as opposed to something that you, you think you should be doing. No, I, I, I totally agree. And that, that's, that, that's one thing we've spoke that uh, Ray Morgan spoke about, um, Scott Iper spoke about as well, is the fact that a lot of these people are doing it because they enjoy it. They're not doing it for the financial rewards it's, it, and the, the limelight that comes with it. They're doing these this type of work because they are dedicated to it and they love what they do. They thoroughly mm. love what they do. And eventually there may be some financial reward from it. There may be some uh, from usually other avenues than, than being in research, but there may be other things that come from it. But the reason that you, you, the common thing for you all is that you just love doing, do it, doing that. And it, that's a strong message to get across to people, as you say, yeah. it's kind of, that, that that's yeah. the bit that we need to get across is that you're never going to be a millionaire like, doing research. No, well, like the financial work, reward, but... um, the financial side of things has never come up with me. Like I've, um, like I think my upbringing and and having that respect for for funding and that respect for for money and sort of going, okay, look, I'm I'm living in a really privileged society and. I've been able to have education and I've been able to go to university and be able to put myself through those paces. Um, having that, that respect and that knowledge from a young age, I think helps with, with that mindset. Um, not thinking that I'm entitled to anything either. I think that's also an important aspect of it, but also I haven't gotten to the career stage that I'm thinking about, Oh, I, I need to, um, I need to have a certain salary a year to be able to pay for certain things. Um, that that hasn't, I mean, that's starting now, but that hasn't sort of been my focus going through my degrees. My my reward come in the form of, you know, being put into this, this volunteer position in this amazing laboratory or my reward was that I was able to get my name published on a paper for the first time and, you know, that, that number's now almost up to 20, which is just mind-boggling but having having that reward is that me I'm a scientist and getting my name out there and that research is actually being read by other people and um, the reward comes from the kids who ask me questions after 
you know, me giving a talk to them or the parents coming up to me and saying, oh, look, you know, I, you're such an inspiration and, um, you know, I'd love for you to come and speak to our school or, you know, my daughter wants to get a photo with you or whatever. Like, they're the types of rewards that I'm receiving at the moment that I'm trying to gain um, as opposed to a financial reward. But it depends on, on what form it comes in for different people. I suppose the, the financial side of things will come at a later stage, but for me at the moment, it's not a huge issue. No, no, no. And I think that's quite obvious as well with, with the way you're talking about things and that is that the fact that you, you're loving the fact that you are helping other people realise what they want to do and, and helping mm. other people's, as you say, parents of, of children and and stuff actually see that their kids can go and do this type of work they can go and, and make a difference in the field that they want to go they want to go in whether that be research or or even just any other any other job that that, that kid wants to do um so yeah, I think... it's just more giving them a, that that sort of different angle as well onto onto science. I mean, the, the main sciences at the moment that we're hearing about, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but I mean, in Australia, a lot of it's about skin cancer research or um, dietitians or, you know, the research that goes into infectious diseases or vaccinations and things like that. They're the type of, that's the mindset that people have of science. And then if you come across and go, look, we're scientists, but we do something completely different and this is what we do, then it doesn't matter if they're young, old, middle-aged, if they've never heard of it, they think, oh, wow, like this is really cool. I didn't know it existed and um, it's amazing what you can do with this type of research and that that's the, the enjoyment I get out of it as well is, is allowing people to have access to knowledge that they didn't previously have any idea about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think let I think that gives us a good segue to move it on to your actual research that you're currently doing and kind of what you actually do day to day uh, as well. So could you tell us a little bit more, a bit more about that, please? Sure. Um, so I'm a current PhD student. So I'm in my final stages of my doctorate, um, final couple of months, and my current research is focusing on uh, exotic species of snakes, so exotic for Australia, um, so non-Australian species. I work mainly on Asian pit vipers, so think Trimacurus, um, Protobothrops, Gloideus, uh, Calisolasma, Dinochistrodon, Hypnali, those types of snakes, and um, two iconic species from uh, Southern Africa, so the Boomslang, and the twig snakes, so Dysphilitis typhus and Thelotornis mozambicus. And what I look at with their venoms is their, their, the coagular toxins within those, those venoms, so the, the toxins that affect the blood, whether it be um, toxins that clot the blood or whether it be toxins that prevent a blood clot from forming. So the, the overarching theme is the coagular toxins. Some are more procoagulant, which clot blood, and some are more anticoagulant, which prevent a blood clot from forming. And looking into that, I look at it from an evolutionary perspective. So how have these toxins come to exist? Um, do closely related species have similar toxins within their venom? Are they having similar effects? Um, I look at it from an antivenom perspective. So the current antivenoms that are actually available, do they work? How well are they neutralizing these, these toxins? Um, do antivenoms that exist work on other species that aren't necessarily the immunizing species? Uh, I look at this, I look at it from um, a pharmaceuticals perspective as well. So the potential to create um, blood clotting disorders pharmaceuticals, so people suffering from haemophilia or preventive stroke medications, heart medication, can we sort of use these types of toxins as, um, as drug designs for these, these blood clotting disorders. So that's, that's generally um, the, the basis of my PhD and then um, what I've done is go into each um, genre, so I, I've split up the Asian pit vipers by genre, so I've got a Trimasurus um, project, I've got a Goideus project, a Protobothrops project, um, I've got one that's actually 
in revision at the moment called the basal project, which is all of the callosal asthma, dinocustridon, hypnali, tropidolamus, and azimiops fay as well, which is not a pit viper, but I've chucked it in there as well. Um, and then I've also got the two um, species from Africa, which that, that paper has been published. Um, so they're very procoagulant. They produce very strong, quick clots in the blood. Um, and that was actually quite interesting because one has antivenom and one doesn't have antivenom. So it was interesting to do neutralization effects on um, the twig snake based off the boom slang antivenom. So we, with the research, we use human plasma. Um, so we recalcify that plasma. We get it donated from the Red Blood Cross here um, in Brisbane. And uh, we use other parts um, of the, the plasma as well. So we can isolate out different factors and, um, and use, use different parts of that for, for assays. So for people who aren't aware, um, within our body, uh, we've got the blood, obviously. And then if you take out all the red blood cells, all of the white blood cells and all of the platelets, you're left with like a yellow liquid called plasma. And plasma contains everything that we need to clot our blood. So if we've got a scratch or a bruise or something like that, our body has its own inbuilt mechanisms which allow for our for our body to prevent ourselves from bleeding out. And um, after a minute or two, um, our scabs will start to form and, um, you know, we've stopped bleeding. People who suffer from hemophilia, have certain parts of that plasma which don't work properly, and then people who are prone to thrombosis, which overclot, um, they, they have, ha have other parts of the, the plasma which um, don't work properly as well. So you've got both ends of the spectrum. Um, so that's called a coagulation cascade, and basically it starts at the top and works its way down like a domino effect. And what Venom has evolved to do uh, across multiple different types of genre across the world whether it be pit vipers or true vipers or elapids um, or um, cool, um, oh, I forgot the other one <laughs> um, yeah so anyways um, whether it be it doesn't matter what type of genre it is um, the, the snakes have the snakes have evolved to affect parts of that cascade. So majority of the research to date is um, focused on the, the bottom half of the cascade. We, we like to call that the common pathway. Um, so factors such as factor 10 or factor 5, um, prothrombin or thrombin enzyme, like enzymes, so to speak. Um, toxins that inhibit fibrinolysis so the, the majority of snake venoms have evolved to sort of operate in that area of the cascade and um, what what my research focuses on is looking at these snake venoms that haven't necessarily been thoroughly investigated from a coagulotoxic um, um, point of view and having a look at where on the cascade do these types of toxins affect? Um, are they very similar to each other? Are they dissimilar to each other? Is what's actually happening in vitro happening um, actually inside the body as well? And is that uh, sort of replicated in symptoms and clinical um, clinical case bite reports as well? So it's, it's quite broad scale, so to speak. But then again, if you look at it, from a wider perspective, it can be quite niche. Yeah. Does that answer that question? <laughs> yeah, it, it does. Sorry, I was just on mute. I was chatting away. I was I kind of came in after you stopped there, and I, I was uh, just on mute. So yeah, so you you kind of mentioned uh, quite a few species that have that, that especially I think a few of us on the line actually have quite a lot of interest in. Um, yeah. So, There's quite some classical names. There's a lot of species in there that um, are kept in European collections, which is, for me, quite interesting. Um, Brian has touched on it a bit in his recent paper, um, um, Snake Bite 
versus human human touch or something along those lines. It's a it's like a review, and he's talked about um, you know this this increase in captive species um, with you know exotic species that aren't native to that area, and then that lack of anti venom that exists or the anti-venom is very hard to get a hold of or it's extremely expensive. So it's not just a, a an issue with people who live in close contact with these types of species. It's also becoming an issue with, um, you know, first world countries that people have access to these exotic snakes. And, yeah. um, you know, yeah. we don't know what happens when they get bitten. Um, there's all these weird and wonderful symptoms that happen depending on who and when and which and how and... So that, that's also the other part of my research is looking at, look, you know, we've got this antivenom for one of these species. Does it work on the others? Um, is, there, is there a way around it? Is there something else that we could use? So there's lots of different angles you can take. Especially with, my, with myself, it's, it's quite interesting because I'm an ex Stellatornis owner and, and Boomslang owner in Incident, oh, incidentally as well I love the slang. they're so beautiful so, so I'm, I'm actually getting some more in a few weeks time which I'm quite excited about <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and some Teletonis which I've been waiting for for months now uh, but yeah oh. um, so that's actually quite interesting that that research is actually going on because right now my, my view is that there, there obviously there is that the anti-venom for, for boom slang but not for, not for Teletonis but it's quite interesting to know that they actually the work is being done to actually see what the effects are of using the the monovalent for the, the boomslang monovalent for yeah. for thalatonis. Well, how that works? I'm not sure if you've read the paper, but it I doesn't have, work. I had chance. I, no, I, I, I did. I did know that. <laughs> <laughs> it works really well for boomslang, but for thalatonis, unfortunately, it's not going to do too much. And I'm just going to have to bleed out of uh, every orifice. Um, oh. <laughs> it's a, a, quite a horrible venom, but um, so so yeah. So it's quite interesting to know that this kind of work is is, is going on, and, and, and not necessarily just for Thelatonus boomslang, as you say, it, it, it's for other species as well that currently yeah. have may have anti venom that's not particularly effective, or um, it may have no anti venom at all, and, it, that, and that's really quite quite interesting. Um, you say you work across a, a load of different uh, different genres of snakes. Do you keep the, uh, Do you have uh, your own lab of which these snakes are kept, or are you using labs across the world to be mm. able to provide the, uh, the venom to you? Yeah. So this is actually a question I get asked a lot. So in Australia, we're only allowed Australian species, uh, which means that no species outside of Australia are we allowed to actually have them in Australia. So I don't have any snakes in the lab at all. We, we've got zero snakes actually. Um, that's, that's due partly because of the upkeep of them as well. The, the cost associated with taking care of these snakes, the, the risk as well. We don't have, uh, it would just be an absolute nightmare with OH&S. Um, but also the fact that Brian's allergic to, um, snake venom as well. Um, particularly a lapid snake venom with majority of three finger toxins so there's a there's multiple issues uh, there's a multiple reasons why we don't have snakes in the lab um so what we do to get around that brian has milked a whole bunch of different types of snakes over his many years of expeditions um and we've actually got quite a large sort of library collection um in the, in the lab so we've got multiple minus 80 um degree celsius freezers um we've got a whole bunch of um, venoms and tissue samples in liquid nitrogen permanently uh, so we've got huge amounts of stock uh, but then if I ever need a top up or if I've got something that's particularly um, interesting and I want that to add that to my, my research um, Brian usually knows someone who knows someone that has that, that particular species and we can usually just get it sent to us so it'll come in a, in a dry form so it's been lyophilized or um, freeze dried and then lyophilized. So it's all the moisture's been sucked out. So it's safe for air travel. It's safe at room temperature, and it's not going to degrade in front of your eyes. Um, but yeah, usually we're getting samples from private collections or from 
zoos or from other universities or from other research facilities that have these animals constantly. Um, sometimes we get them from, from facilities who have them just for pharmaceutical use, so for antivenom production or research themselves. So depending on how rare the species is or depending on how much venom it usually yields determines the price. Um, so it can be anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars, depending on the species. So, yeah, that, that's how we get around not being able to have any snake species um, or exotic species in Australia. There are other researchers in my lab, so other PhD students who are working on Australian species, but um, she's actually had to go and milk all of her samples, So, which... Um, and, and she's actually been able to get a lot of samples from other keepers around Australia, so to get different localities of the same species. So, yeah, I mean, if you're lucky enough to find someone who has multiple different types of captive snakes or um, or actual offspring and the parents, you can do different researches, uh, research projects. You can do like an ontogenetic shift or you can do adult versus juvenile or you can do yeah it depends on what samples you've got which really de determines the project um out of my experience it might be completely different in other laboratories around the world but that's unfortunately that's the limitation that we have to work with yeah that's actually quite interesting because obviously we knew about the um the, the lack of um well, obviously, we knew about the, the lack of being able to have other species in, in Australia, but we thought we may, with it being a educational, an, a, a, an educational institute, that you may have been able to get around different laws regarding that, but obviously, obviously not. No. So, so kind of what do you do day to day? What, what kind of is a typical day to day in, when you're in, within the research facil facility? Yeah, so it, it changes daily which I think is also part of the reason why I love what I do because every day is different um, I don't know what challenges I'm going to come up against I don't know what results I'm going to get I don't know you know what what issues I'm going to walk into that I'm going to have to solve so I, I think I really like that aspect even though sometimes I'm just hating it, it it's like on a broad scale generally speaking I really do enjoy um, the, the differences that I obtain so I generally, like during my PhD, um, also my my lifestyle has changed. So I, I try and um, maintain a, a healthy work balance lifestyle. Um, during my undergrad, I learnt my lessons very well that I can work myself into the ground, but I'm going to pay for it. So I, I tried to do everything in my power to not be like that. It depends on the person as well. Some people can work quite rigorously and not have any consequences and then other people you won't see them for three years and then all of a sudden they'll have a PhD. So for me I try and keep um, you know, that constant contact with the lab and, and keeping involved with other people and involved in other projects and regular meetings with um, my supervisors to make sure that they know that I'm being productive but also that they know that I'm, I'm, you know, still keen and eager and still doing good work. So um, I also have a, a part-time job as well. I'm a lifeguard. So those types of, those days, um, if I'm working of an evening, I, I generally work from home. So it's also another point I wanted to add is that it depends on your supervisor when you're doing um, a higher research degree, what they allow you to do so some some supervisors want you to be there nine to five or you know from 7 a.m before they get in or they want you to be there on weekends or working late like it really depends on the supervisor whereas brian which is one of the massive perks is that he doesn't he doesn't mind as long as you're being productive and as long as you're doing what needs to be done then he doesn't care how you get it done some people work of a morning and they come into the lab in the evenings and overnight. Some people only um, generally come in over weekends because it's quieter on campus. Um, but I generally like to work on Monday to Friday and I generally like to keep it that it's full-time working hours because I like to treat my PhD as a full-time job. 
um, and for me that's easier to manage uh, I try to keep my weekends free whether it's uh, for my sporting activities or for my socializing activities um, you know general house duties so then when I'm actually on campus and, and going Monday to Friday, you know, that's the time that I'm working, that's the time that I'm answering emails and I'm available um, for my research. So if I'm having what we call a wet lab day, which is when you have the lab coats on and the, the gloves and the glasses and things and you're, and you're generally working with, you're, in, you're actually in the lab, um, I can be doing all different types of assays. So I would generally have to book out um, the machine that I wanted to use, I generally book it out for a day or a half day and I try and get into campus around 9am um, and, and stay until later in the evening. If I have to leave earlier, then I, I try and come in earlier. Um, you know, if I've got training of an afternoon or something, if I've had an appointment in the morning, then I might come in, you know, at 10 or 11, but then I will always stay later so I'll stay until seven eight nine o'clock at night um it really doesn't worry me as long as I've got food um so yeah if I've if I've booked out a machine then I'll come in I'll check my emails uh, I mean I've got my email on my phone as well but I like to type replies um you know I'll check Twitter um generally on my commute uh, I'll check other social media platforms like LinkedIn or um you know, my Facebook page or something like that. Um, and then I, um, I might have a read of the news headlines, have a chat to everyone else who's in the lab. I'm a, I'm a massive chatter. I think that's where I procrastinate a lot. Um, and then I, uh, I, I listen to podcasts, a lot of podcasts. I love true crime um, or true crime thrillers. And, as you know, if I've got my headphones in, then people generally know that I'm, I'm working hard. So... Uh, I'll, I'll set up for the day. I might be running um, blood assays, so I'll have to get my venoms that that I need to work with. Um, I'll have my lab book with the protocol written out, um, and I might be filling in gaps or starting something completely fresh. And um, yeah, so we've got two main labs. We've got the what we call the venom lab, which is where a lot of um, where all our venom is stored in the minus 80 freezers. We have all our massive lab. Um, workbenches a lot of the equipment is in this laboratory and then we've got a slightly smaller lab which is very cold very very cold um, and we have all of our blood assay machines in there so everything that we work with with blood or, or with plasma we work in that laboratory everything else is in the other laboratory so I'm going between both of them quite reg um, regularly and um, yeah, usually the majority of my PhD I've been in the blood lab because that's where the majority of my research has been taking place. We've got, um, well, we had three three different machines in there, but one got moved. So now we've only got two in there. Um, but, yeah, that's generally where I spend most of my time. So I'll usually work um, up until lunch or through lunch um, around 2 o'clock. I might have a quick break and have something to eat. Um, you know, drinking water is actually quite, it might sound funny, but it's actually quite hard to remember to drink water when you're in really cold air conditioning and you're on the go all the time. So, and because you can't have water bottles in, in laboratories, um, you, you've got to remember to sort of go in and out of the lab all the time. And every time you go out of the lab, you've got to take all your gloves and lab coat off and wash your hands and things like that. So... Um, as funny as that sounds, it's it's a common problem between researchers is that sort of, it's almost like a lazy thing that we, we don't leave the lab if we don't really have to. So you're quite thirsty by the end of the day. Um, yeah, and then, then I'll, I'll generally have lunch. Sometimes I might have a lunch meeting um, or I might have a meeting with Brian. So if I've got assays that are running, um, sometimes they have long incubation periods, so half an hour or an hour. Sometimes the assay might take 10 minutes for it to finish. Um, I'll generally be in and out doing other stuff. So I'm, I'm generally doing like three things at once. Um, I might be helping someone, you know, learn a new technique or I might be troubleshooting someone else's project or I might be prepping for my next step or, um, you know, 
I might be halfway through a protocol that's, you know, a three-day protocol or something and, and doing that at the same time. So if I'm in the wet lab area, it's, it's generally quite busy and quite full on those days. Um, and then in the afternoon, um, if, if I haven't finished what I needed to do, then, uh, you know, I'll still be running those assays um, and you can't stop once you've started generally. You, you just have to keep going. So other days, especially during the end of my PhD, I've tried to wrap up a lot of my data collection so I'm not in the lab as often. Uh, I try to, to do a lot of writing. So that might be working on you know, the introduction part of it or finishing up results analyses or doing edits on a manuscript or something like that. And I can do that from home or I can do that on campus. If I'm on campus, I generally try to um, limit it for my writing capabilities because I tend to get distracted quite easily, um, whether that be from colleagues or having chats with Brian or um, you know, catching up with friends for coffee or something like that. Whereas if I'm at home by myself, you know, my housemates have gone to work for the day and it's just me and my computer, and I can generally just zone in and just write for hours. Um, I also find it quite difficult to swap between wet lab and writing constantly. So I try to do them in big blocks. So if I've got heaps of data that I need to collect, I'll do that over a couple of weeks and then I'll try and analyze that all after that. So it's just, I'm doing one major thing at a time. So at the moment I'm, I'm trying to write um, up a lot of my experiments. So I, I might only have like one or two days left of wet lab for my PhD and then that's all all of my data collected and then all of it's just computer analyses. So with with my PhD, I've published quite a lot of my research already. Um, I've got another two papers that have just been submitted, so they're under review at the moment. And I've got another two, possibly three, depending on, on the plan um, that I want to actually write. So um, I'll start, oh, I'll finish, I should say, finish off the, the data analyses for those and then I can actually start constructing the paper, the introduction and the discussion and, and writing up all of those results. So I've never just got one thing on the go. I've got three or four. Um, and that I like operating like that because I can, it, it's, there's always something to do. So if, if one of the machines breaks down or if you're troubleshooting something and you just get so frustrated with it, you can't even look at it anymore, you've got something else that you can work on and you, you've got that constant work um, flow of work so it's a steady pace as opposed to lots of ups and downs um, which is what a lot of PhD students I feel um, experience they, they have these huge bursts and they work for months and months and months and months and months and they just burn themselves out and by the time it comes to writing they just can't even look at their work anymore so I try to keep it at quite an even pace um, and so far so good um, we'll see what happens by the end of the year <laughs> once, now, I, once I've quite handed interesting. in. One thing I was very interested in, Jordan, is that you mentioned earlier about obviously a lot of your work being in what you termed as exotic species, non-Australian uh, <coughs> species, for example. Has that been something of your choosing or is that something as, as being that you, you've chose to study this subject area and it's just a consequence of that effectively? Or has... Yeah. has how do you find the like the Australian venoms? How how well have they been researched to the uh, non-native Australian reptiles? And is there is there some sort of imbalance there? Some opportunities in studying exotic species that have already maybe been covered in studying Australian species? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I I had some say, not not a huge amount of say though. Um, I was quite flexible with with my projects and what I was given. I was just happy to do something on whatever. Um, so in my undergrad, I started out with like one of my first projects um, or first lots of venom that I was given to work on were um, American pit vipers. And so the Bothrops, the Bothriacus and the Bothropsis and Echistrodon and things like that. Um, and it was just the venom that Brian had a project for at the time. He had this this idea about these species and and that was it. I was like, yep, cool, I'll just do that. So 
I think my knowledge of pit vipers um, was already a strength that I had. So having worked through them on, on undergrad, so I had some knowledge there already. My honours project was all Calibre Day. So um, I had Boiga as my study species and I did the entire genus of Boiga. And um, I mean, that was completely different new territory for me. Um, you know, they're, they're not vipers at all. And um, and that's, that's just the project that I was given at the time. It was really interesting. It was, um, there, were, there was a, a gap in the knowledge. So we, we like to call that a literature knowledge gap. And if you can fill that gap, then nine times out of 10, you're gonna be able to publish a paper from that research. And as a, as a scientist, as a researcher, the last thing you wanna do is spend all this time and effort and hours and hours, you know, months of work and not have anything to show for it. Because, I mean, that, that's what's happened. I've, I can account for at least nine months, six to nine months of work that I've done throughout my PhD that's just not going to ever get published. It's just part and parcel of the research. You, you troubleshoot. It's, it's stuff that doesn't work out. It's stuff that gets dropped out of the paper because it's not, um, it's not important. It's not that it's not important, but it's, it doesn't add or take anything from the paper. It's not um, adding any more value. So... Yeah, that, that, there's that as well. So how I got onto um, my study species for my PhD was that um, with with this this coagulation side of things or the blood side of things, Brian had won a, a, um, an equipment grant and that's how we got all of this new blood equipment in the lab. And I was already finishing up some stuff from my undergraduate days on um, pit vipers and part of that was the um, was the Asian pit vipers and Brian said well you might as well add that into your PhD um, because you're doing it during your PhD time and I thought great you know at least I can get rewarded for it it's not just volunteer time and then that just grew and grew and grew so it went from a handful of species to um, five to ten genre of different species of snake and it just grew and grew and grew and it was just, it was great because Brian actually had all of those snake species in existence and I was able to add a couple new species that I, I didn't have in the freezer and um, and then the way I got the boom slang and the twig snake was from my Calibra Day um, knowledge from my honours and uh, I think it was Nick Casewell, he actually sent us some of that venom and um, that's how that got added into the project. So I was actually the first to, to learn all of the new machinery, um, troubleshoot a lot of the protocols. Um, so basically being, you know, the pioneering stage on these, on these new coagulation assays and um, as a result, I was able to get rewarded through publication and authorship. Um, and so those species that um, that I was able to, to use, you know, got added into my PhD projects. So that, that's how my projects got formed and that's how I started working on those species. I, I didn't sit out going, you know, I want to work on pit vipers or I want to work on um, African colubrids. It was just part and parcel of what I was able to obtain at the time but just with the other part of your question um there was another an, another colleague of mine christina she is heavily heavily involved in asian elapids loves them has so much more knowledge about them than i ever will and she was starting her phd at the same time but she came into Brian's lab with ideas about her own research and she knew that she wanted to answer these questions and this is how she wanted to answer those questions. Whereas me, I, I wanted to do, to do the research but I needed help formulating questions. I didn't have burning questions that I needed to answer. I was just happy to contribute any which way. So she, she's, um, she's very passionate about what she does as well but she, she sort of had all of the, the Australian elapids already covered so to speak, um, and and her projects are very very large in terms of um, Australian elapids. But there there has been 
a lot of research done on especially the iconic Australian elapids and um, she's been able to fill in a lot of the gaps and debunk a lot of the myths about the venom that um, that exists in Australia. Would you say there's a knowledge gap between Australian species and non-native Australian species? Because from an outsider's uh, look into it, it seems that the Australian species seems to be very extensively studied compared to other species in other parts of the other parts of the world. Um, and yeah. I you've got a lot of venom researchers and a lot of herpetologists actually in Australia uh, so it kind of makes sense from that point of view. I was just wondering what your what your thoughts on that were. Yeah I think that's I think that's because of where we live in the world and, and what we have in our backyard. We are very fortunate with the type of species that we have and and also the, the, the amount of people that are enthusiastic about them as well so that that aids in that type of research having been conducted also the fact that you know Sunai textilis has um, this really specific toxin in their venom that everyone else is trying to find it in other closely related species so that that helps with that type of research um, and the fact that we have amazing anti-venoms because it is needed yeah. you know you can guarantee that if you're bitten by a snake in Australia you will be absolutely fine because of the amount of research and um, that, that that has gone into developing these anti venoms because of what we have in our backyard. Um, yeah. Well, that's something but, Scott I mean, went. That's something that Scott Iper went into in in quite considerable detail. That actually, the for the number of bites per year to the number of death ratio, it's like one percent, which is very very low. Mm. Um, was for especially especially for the the species that you have and the toxicity of the species you have is very very low and then he says it's a case of of that one percent they're all of uh, of probably of uh texture texturalist because of of their the the difference in their venom compared to a lot of the other lapids that you you have there so yeah. he said the kind of it's only really one species that people struggle and it's through the complications um of that extra component in their venom compared to other species is the reason why why they have the deaths compared to the others and it, it, it was quite interesting to actually go into it in in that detail really yeah um, i mean it's not my expertise area i know a little bit about it but that's exactly right and i mean if you look at the species that i'm working on from you know the asian pit vipers they're in areas that people very it's very very difficult to get to and i mean unless you're living in these areas already it is extremely hard to penetrate those types of environments um because you want to go and find snakes so you'd have to be an extremely keen herper and with all the right gear and know exactly what you're looking for um to be able to go and obtain those snake species but in saying that as well like there's people that live with these snakes day in day out and that there's estimates of snake bite cases per year and mortality and morbidity mor morbidity rates that exist but it's it depends on who's counting and who's actually recording these numbers because it's it varies um and that's that's the other part of my research is looking at you know you might not die from these snake bites from these exotic species but you're definitely not going to have the, a great rest of the life like you've got people who are breadwinners and they just have absolutely life long de debil de debilitating um, permanent um, disabilities that they have to now live with for the rest of their life whether that be internal or external disabilities um, and, and damages and um, unfortunately that's just the way of life for these people and we, as researchers, yeah, there's been a little bit done about them, but they're mainly done on the most medically significant species, the ones who are killing the most people. But as soon as you take into account the the um, the permanent damages and these people who can't work anymore, it, that's just a whole other kettle of fish in terms of you know the economic impact um, that that snake bite actually has on on these people. Yeah. 
Definitely, and that's something that we go into into obviously more detail in other episodes about that impact that it has between e- even if uh, somebody survives a snake bite, what what that impact is to their daily life and and, and to how they can make a living and etc. In other yeah. things, but I think that kind of definitely from our, our standpoint in in this kind of conversation, I, I think. I've I've lost my train of thought. This always happens when you monologue. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I think actually we we could maybe move this move the conversation on a little bit more to kind of what you see as some of the of of the issues and such forth that you 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 have in your day to day in your day to day job with being a, a woman in in science and kind of how those issues and kind of how the perspective of women in science has changed over the time that you've been in you've been in science yourself um and that and that kind of thing Mm. yeah um so i I've, this is a question i get asked a lot actually as well and i don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate but i've actually had no issues at all and i don't know if that's because of um the environment that i've always existed in I don't know if that's because of my personality I don't know if that's because of the university that I've gone to I don't know if that's because of my upbringing and all all my parents but I've never been told I can't do something because of my gender and I've never been sort of disregarded or or looked down upon because of my gender Um, but in saying that there are so many people out there so many women girls that I know um, that have completely opposite experiences to myself and it's absolutely heartbreaking and I still don't understand why it's an issue like why is it a topic that we even have to talk about anymore seriously because I mean in this day and age it shouldn't be it really shouldn't be an issue but unfortunately it is um you know so we have to have these competitions like women in STEM and we have to have these camps for girls to to say, look, you can do just as great as the boys. You know, you can do whatever you want to do. You can be what you you, you idolise um, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And um, growing up, I I never saw a difference. I never never noticed it. Um, I, I didn't have any difficulties with it. Um, and I, that might be just where where I exist in the world um very different case in engineering um that 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 sort of avenue of stem um very different for international girls who come over um very different depending on the career level that you're at um it it depends on really who you talk to and and um and their background but for me personally I haven't had any um issues or um, yeah, any any sort of troubles or hoops to jump through. I've that, as you were saying in engineering. To... Sorry, you go. As you were saying in engineering, we we have seen we see this issue quite quite considerably. That we see it more with older, maybe older generations. In my workplace, we're a hundred year old company. We've had guys that have worked there for they're getting on nearly fifty plus years. And we see the issue where we have young, incredibly gifted female engineers come into the business and people just refusing to work with them and mm. and that. And it seems to be definite. Maybe it's more of a generational gap. Oh, that the 100%. Issue is, that the issue is I that. I think it's um, also a cultural thing as well, definitely. But... Yeah, mainly generational and and what your upbringing is, like what what you're willing to think is correct or right or wrong or what you're willing to put up with. Like it's it's definitely um, definitely an issue and it's not uh, the fact that it's worldwide as well is is quite incredible. Well, we actually see because my, my the company I work for is multinational, and we actually see that there's a higher percentage of female engineers in in Asia than we do in the Western world. So, for instance, we see we see quite a high number of female engineers in China and India, and it seems very much more pushed 
in those countries, in those what we could have called developing countries up until, but mm. well, India's probably still very developing and so is China, but they're now mm. at a point where their infrastructure and their, and the way that they think and everything is, is starting to surpass the Western world yeah. as regards to cultural it's... things. That's that's very interesting. I think it's um it's also to do with that that um the generation as well. So that mindset that the woman's meant to be at home and the man's meant to be out being a breadwinner. But I mean, if you look at what we classify as a normal um, societal, you know, accepted type of um, gender role, so to speak, there is no norm. Like you can do whatever you want. I mean men stay at home women go to work you've got same-sex marriages um you've got women who don't want to have children who don't want to get married you've got men doing the exact same like it it, the 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 norm isn't the norm anymore and that's what people have to sort of get on board with especially who have been at these companies for decades and they still want to insist on pushing this this mindset on these, as you said, brilliantly young, you know, brilliantly minded young um, women coming through the ranks. The uh, and, and unfortunately, like, you have to have these types of awards that are just for women in STEM or just for women in engineering or just for women in, you know, mathematics or um, technology or s- things like that because for far too long it's been male-dominated. Um and I get asked the question as well, you know, do you find it more in your field of work because it is a male-dominated field, you know, with snakes and reptiles and that type of thing, not just science? And I said, well, not really, because the majority of people doing science or the majority of people who are my age doing science are women. You know, they've, they've just finished their undergrad, they're doing their PhD, they haven't thought about having a family yet, they haven't settled down, they're career-driven, so I don't see a difference, but you go across to the next lab or you go across to the next institute or the next city, then it's a completely different kettle of fish. And I think that's just, I think that's supervisors as well. Um, I've heard some absolute horror stories about supervisors who are not um, very fair or um, who, who say very condescending comments or are very sexist in their remarks. But I've been absolutely blessed with someone who is you know if you can do the work and you're you're up for the task then you're the right person for the job it doesn't matter if you're a male or female um it's got nothing to do with it if you are there to do the work and you can do the work well then then that you're the person for it um but yeah un- unfortunately i do have friends and and other colleagues in other labs who cop that type of um that, that those type of, types of comments daily um i see it more on social media platforms so i i generally tend to receive it from people who aren't in the academic realm um who are enthusiasts so to speak as opposed to actual academics doing the research that's that's generally where i I tend to cop any type of sexist comments or any type of issues with being a woman in STEM, um, so to speak. But apart from that, I don't have any issues. Yeah, I think, I th- I th- as you say, I think it, it, it's definitely generational. I think academia up until quite, I feel like up until quite recently, has been very driven by people that would say they've got experience in quotation marks uh, and mainly they are of older generations because they've been doing they've been in a business for years on end they've come into the end of what what companies see as their usable shelf life as regards to uh, mm. uh, as as in innovation or the way that they do things so that they then become move into academia to keep their career going or it's just their natural advancement in their career and then they take that ideology with them and i think especially this it feels like especially recently that academia is becoming younger um yeah i I mean that's not everyone Uh, i mean that's 
I think that it is becoming younger and there are more people who are a lot more open to it. Like, especially in my immediate circle at the University of Queensland and then in Brisbane, because we have these awards and we've got a lot of strong women who are voicing their concerns and talking openly about their experiences and saying, you know, I've, um, I've had this happen or I've had these types of issues and I'm overcoming this. I think that it's becoming now that it's becoming more of a more on the forefront and everyone knows about it it's it's um it is becoming less and less of of an issue but I mean that's that's in my immediate circle in science and I'm not saying that that is the case for everyone everywhere and unfortunately it's going to take a lot longer in a lot of other countries um and other parts of the world for this sort of this to you know catch on um until it's not an issue anymore is there anything you would give in terms of advice to maybe younger women that were considering uh, a career or have general interest in the STEM subjects? Advice? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do it. Definitely. If, if you are enthusiastic and passionate and you want to be in a position that you can actually generally change the world in very small quantities but you are definitely changing the world and you are contributing to the broader knowledge of everything around us then 110 percent get involved um it is such a rewarding place to be if if you're if you've got the right um mindset in terms of you're there for the right reasons um then yeah give it a go it's it's something that i think everyone should have more knowledge about and I often say this if everyone does a basic biology course then there would be it would just change a lot of people's opinions and views about a lot of things Um, but yeah in terms of having a career in STEM then yeah definitely it's it's one of the most broad um, flexible career paths to take as well you're not pigeonholed into one area you've, you've got skills across multiple disciplines that you can chop and change and mix and utilize in co- completely different areas but they are they are very transferable as well so it's not knowledge that's going to be wasted if you transition into another area which is i find quite unique in terms of career paths yeah yeah i i, I agree with that i think going into a STEM subject as you say is, is very flexible like there's the masses of different types of engineering there's masses of different types of scientific research that are all you, you can take learnings from one and, and apply them to others and 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 I think that, that that's one of the wonderful parts of of STEM subjects is that they yeah. are all so closely related in a lot of ways so you won a prize in 2017 uh, the women 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 in STEM uh, prize in 2017. Can you explain a little bit more about how that may have affected your career going forward and kind of uh, what what the piece of work you did to actually win that award? Yeah, um, so in Brisbane, uh, we have something called the World Science Festival. It's actually just finished um, on Friday. And uh, one, one of the good things that my supervisor Brian actually does is pushes for us to win awards and get our research out there which which in turn you know creates good publicity for the lab and good publicity for our research and and attracts new funding as well so part of the requirement uh, you know from a PhD perspective is to not only come out with papers but to come out with other things on your CV so I um, I'm very proactive when it comes to going to panel discussions and workshops and things like that and it was actually a fluke email that I received about a communications workshop that I went to and that's where I heard about this Women in STEM prize Um, and one of the requirements you had to do was a two minute video about your research and how it can actually impact and contribute to Queensland which is the state that I live in Um, and Queenslanders, so the lives of the, the local community, basically. And um, I, I just um, 
I was working really hard on um, publishing the the manuscript about um, the boom slang and the twig snake. So I used that as a basis of my my video and the the pharmaceutical drug design development angle, um, helping the lives of Queenslanders, you know, with blood clotting disorders, which is uh, obviously a long-term goal, um, but it is something that a lot of people don't realise that it's research that's happening. So a lot of people suffer from side effects and they're on these these drugs for the rest of their life, but they have to put up with these side effects. So if we're utilising something that Mother Nature has, you know, spent millions of years designing, then why not use it and um, yeah sort of creating awareness around something that isn't necessarily thought of as life-saving you know everyone thinks of snakes that, that they can kill you but they can actually save our lives in the end um, so taking that angle as well and it was through um, yeah so I, I'd gone to this communications uh, workshop and then two weeks later the, the submissions had closed and it was such a whirlwind of two weeks. I've never created something that quick in my life. Um, and, yeah, I ended up winning. So it was a, I won the People's Choice Award, so it was through a, a lot of social media pumping. Um, and I, and that's a huge thanks to Brian and all of his contacts and their contacts around the world, you know, pushing for this type of um, research to be out there and and it was I think it was at a good time as well because it was it was at a time that this research wasn't talked about a lot um you know there wasn't many young females in this field doing too much on the social in the on the science communication side about it and um yeah it's I think it was just a you know right place right time type of thing and yeah as a result I ended up winning um, so it was five thousand Australian dollars, which for me was quite a large sum of money, but it would only really get me to and from Europe and uh, and a conference um, uh, registration fee. So I did have to try and win another sum of money. Um, so there was another sum of money at the University of Queensland I was able to win in conjunction. Um, again, it was a, a very hard award to win, but because I'd had the funding from the Women in STEM prize, I was able to win that one as well. So I was able to fund my entire trip to Europe um, and China through these awards, which was amazing. Um, and that was just absolutely life-changing. Like from where I was prior to that award to the roller coaster that I went on, I had no idea what to expect. Um, I had to create a Twitter account. I had to create a new Facebook page. I had people ringing me up for ABC interviews. I had people ringing me up for newspaper interviews. I had people ringing me up for photo shoots and wanting to know more about me and my story and how my, you know, influences changed my perspective on science and all of the, the stuff that I do with science. I had people flying me up to far north Queensland to chat to them about science and their schools and I had people finding me on Facebook asking me to do school talks and, um, you know, libraries calling me up to do, you know, lectures and people wanting to just generally talk to me about science and it's sort of, it happened overnight. It was absolutely incredible. Um, but then I sort of had to come back down to earth and be like, look, like, I've, I've, got, I've still got to do my PhD, I've still got to do my research. and. A um, couple of months later, I went over to Europe and went to my first conference, which was also my first international conference uh, in Berlin. Um, so I had previously been to Europe, but this was a very different trip. Um, so yeah, I went to this conference in Berlin, which is actually coming up again in Melbourne, um, the ISTH conference this year, which I'm very excited about. So that was all about blood. You know, there's heaps of clinicians there and researchers and doctors and specialists. And it was, I could not have thought, it, like, it was just amazing. I, I was like still lost for words at how incredible this experience was. Um, and then I spent some time over in a collaborative lab in Leiden in, in Holland, um, which was amazing. So like, t you know, top of the top 
institute over there working with some one of the lead um, world researchers um, in what she does, Mateen, Dr. Mateen Boss, which she's a fascinating, absolutely amazing woman. Um, and the lab that she runs there and the research that they're doing. So I worked there for about six to seven weeks um, and then went to England, which was really fun. And I uh, spoke at Oxford University. So the fact that I actually got to go to Oxford and then speak at Oxford was the coolest thing ever. Um, but just being there, I just had to pinch myself. Like I could not believe that I was, you know, in Oxford, but also presenting to other people in my field that they're actually sitting there listening to what I had to talk about, um, about my research that I was doing in Australia. Because up until then, like I talk about imposter syndrome, but it was like hardcore imposter syndrome. Um, like I was just a little PhD student just trying to get my degree and here I am on the other side of the world contributing to the broader knowledge of science which was like I still can't believe that that happened um, and then yeah um, I come back to Australia and not long after that I went to another conference in China um, which was all about toxins and um, that was a completely different kettle of fish um, very very different experience um, but again couldn't believe that I was in this part of the world talking to you know world leaders in this type of research and they sat there and listened to what I had to say it was quite incredible and just the people you meet along the way and the networking and the contacts like I've got contacts all over the world now and they're, they're my own contacts you know they're, they're not contacts that I've made through my supervisor or through someone who's in my lab like I've gone out and gotten them myself so there's that aspect of as of it as well which is really rewarding it's a, it's another level of what this from winning that award what it's been able to do for me in my career progress and and where it's set me up for the rest of my um, degree and, and career path today it's it was amazing but in saying that you you've got to sort of take these opportunities and just run with it and and do what you can with it make the most of it because if you just go oh yeah cool I've, I've won the award and I might go to this conference and you know chat to the people I already know then it's it's going to be a wasted a wasted opportunity um, but if you if you just take it full on um, it, it's amazing where it can take you it's and I say this to the kids that I talk to you know science can take you all over the world if you know if you if you take the opportunities that come with it I mean it's, it's too easy to just sit in the lab for three years and you know just do your research and sit behind the same white desk every day but if you actually are proactive with with what you're actually doing um it, it can take you everywhere and it, it's taking me all over Queensland as a result so it's got my name out there I mean you guys have contacted me um you know, the the radio stations here in Australia um the newspapers you know, schools over in uh, Mount Isa, which are like 2,000 kilometres away, um, you know, the, the people that know who I am, which is quite amazing. Um, but as a result, I was able to win another award at UQ in, in the science faculty, um, which again, other people who are not in my discipline know who I am. The, the professors who used to lecture me in undergrad know who I am. Um, you know, they follow me on Twitter, which is... I still have, I still can't believe that. Um, but yeah, like it, it's just, I, I can't seem to sort of grasp completely what that, just that one moment um, has been able to do for me. And I wasn't even going to apply. I was just stoked that I had a two minute video that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, couldn't even begin to imagine what opportunities it was going to do for me but it's also helped Brian out as well um, with this publicity for the lab and the research that we've been doing it's, it's helped with grant writing and um, publicity for him and his his work as well so it's it's yeah it's just it's just a ripple effect that's just kept going and going and going it sounds like it's been a, a, a pretty incredible journey, actually, since, you, since you've, oh. you've won it. It seems like everything's just snowballed and escalated into something else, well, which is really good to see. Yeah, it's been two years, pretty much, to the day. Um, 
and it's it's still having an effect. It's in, it's insane. It it does seem so. Um, so you you spoke a little bit there actually about um about how you use social media and stuff. Do you have you seen uh as we've we've mentioned before that there is a bit of a disconnect between the hobby and academia, and actually. Do you see any ways that we can help improve using social media, help improve get the like the work of you and Brian and other people out out there to make it a bit more of an understandable format? We're using these social media outlets. Yeah. Um, so when I first started, you know, you had the Facebook um, and you had your Instagram and things like that. So it depends on the platform that you use as a professional. So. A lot of um, people that I'm, well, you know, academics that I'm in contact with steer away from Facebook and Instagram as a professional platform and they generally use Twitter or LinkedIn that to connect between, you know, the, the um, enthusiasts uh, and the academics. Twitter's probably one of the best platforms to do it on. Um, it can be quite impersonal. It's quick, it's easy, uh, you can retweet things, you can put links up without it having to be all about Facebook, which can just get completely chaotic. Um, and, yeah, it, see, I, I, um, I've got two pages. One is my personal page and the other page is like a sort of a branding for myself and I had to have that Um whilst I was going through that process because I was getting contacted so much and because people wanted to follow me and ask questions and they wanted to know about my research and I didn't have that issue prior. I just had my own personal page and then that was the, then that was it. But as, as a result, you know, if you're going to have all this attention, you're going to have to have some sort of outlet. And unfortunately, as much as I dislike social media, it is a very, very useful to, tool if you use it properly. Um, I mean, you don't have to be on there every day. You don't have to do it um, all the time. It can get very, very time-consuming and very draining. But probably um, me personally, Twitter's probably one of the best tool uses. Um, I, like a lot of the the journals that I publish in have Twitters, um, and you know they they're always tweeting the latest pub, um, publication or their latest issue or things like that. So, yeah, it's it really depends on the person. But um, but then again, like Facebook pages are good. It's just on Twitter you have, um, not that you have less nasty comments, but I think it's less... Um, I think it's less, less prone in, to that. It's less interactive, isn't it? I think, and that's one thing that we we found um, with with obviously with social media and trying to put papers out there and such forth uh, with 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 the podcast pages that we find that we get a lot more negative reaction on Facebook because it's more interactive than what yeah. we get on Instagram, for instance. Because Instagram's yeah. very much, oh, here's a photo, here's some information about it. And, and, and that's about it. You like it or, and you read it yeah. and you move on, where Facebook yeah. seems to be very much... And I think those, the people who generally give those negative comments are just on Facebook, like they don't have anything else. And it was sort of in that sort of grey area that you've got to have all of the social media platforms to try and promote something. Because you know, not everyone's on just one thing. They're they're across multiple different platforms, and people are looking at different times of the day, and you've got different time zones and things like that. So you've got to you've got to have those different, yeah, ac accessible points. Unfortunately, I also think it yeah, re regionally as well. There's a difference between social media between regionally as well. Um, so we kind of find we have a lot more interaction on Facebook from. America than what we do with the other regions as well. Uh, yeah. And and I, I I think that having people like yourself uh, who does have some social media presence really helps close that gap between academia and the hobby that that yeah. is needed to be closed. But you've also got to be mindful about 
what you're doing on social media. So, uh, yes, I do have a social media presence, but I don't want a social media presence. Um, like it doesn't phase me. It helps with some sort of promotion, but I I don't necessarily need it, so to speak. It's just happened. Um, I haven't set out to try and get a social media presence. And then it can get quite overwhelming in some instances. So when, when it first started, um, it was very overwhelming. And your phone is just going off constantly because it's so easily accessible. Um, and I've had to really rein it back in the last year um, because it was getting too intense. Um, so yes, I'm still there, but I'm not tweeting, I'm not posting, I'm not commenting as often as I was because it was just far too time consuming. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the beauties of, of like podcasts is because you get the you can get the information out there without having to necessarily have that full interaction with the listening audience as regards to yeah. having all, long all the followers as well. Like you, yeah. you like I'm gonna be able to reach a far broader scope of audience than I would ever have been able to prior. Yeah, definitely. And I think that kind of leads us on, actually, to uh, to some of our listeners' questions. Um, I would... I- I'm going to hand you over to... Hand, uh, hand it over to Tom, because Tom has, has uh, organised the, the questions. So, Tom, would you like to take over? Yeah, sure. Um, OK, so the first one is sounds quite interesting. It's, uh, it says, so, I'd like to know why we're unable to produce an antivenom chemically without the need for milking snakes. Also, do you see a time when it will be possible to chemically produce it? I think Ed kind of answered a wee bit of this one, but last, Jordan. Um, so antivenom production is not my area of expertise. I know very little about antivenom production. Um, there, There is research going on, I know for a fact, that we're trying to, I say we, like collectively, the, the, the broader scientific yeah. um, academic realm, um, we are trying to produce um, antivenoms that only have the active toxins in it. So prior there wasn't, a, there is, I mean, there is still a need to milk, milk the, the species that you're trying to immunize against because you want to get everything in there. But you also, um, there is also research going into just focusing on just the, the specific toxins that are actually having that effect. I mean, snake venoms, for example, are made up of, you know, 200 to 250 different types of toxins. But not every single one of them is having an effect. There might only be a handful that are the active toxins. Um, so that, that is happening. It is very time consuming. It is very expensive. Um, and it, it will eventually become more mainstream once the technology catches up with the theory. Um, but until then, it, it is, yes, we do need to milk the snakes um, or, or the species that we're trying to immunise against um, because really we, we're not 100%, um, we, we don't really know 100% you know how these toxins are working synergistically we know that this type of toxin is having this effect but we don't know if if we take that out are the other are the other toxins going to fill its place or are, are they working all in one big mixture or is it just a couple because i mean in reality the the, the snake's not going to produce something that's not necessary it's far too energetic um far too um expensive um, energy wise to produce something that's not needed so um, once we figure that out then yes the, the, we can we will be able to produce them chemically but um, that's it's a long way off oh, very well hopefully answered. that answers that question yeah um, okay so we'll go on to the next one so it's uh, with the venoms you have studied uh, what species do you believe is most likely going to make the biggest contributions to drug design and development in the future? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, it depends on what you classify 
as the drug design development realm. It depends on what you're looking at. It could come from anywhere. Um, Callus elasmorotostoma is one of those snakes that is very unique in where it's situated evolutionary um, and phylogenetically and its actual venom. I mean, there has been some um, attempt at making drugs off its venom um, and I think that that's somewhere that can be um, further investigated. There, there, was a, there was a drug for a preventative stroke medication. Um, but there has to be that, that need for it as well. So my, my look was going, okay, well, if this venom exists in this capacity, are other closely related species very similar and can, is it easier to make something off, those, off that, um, that snake venom? So for, for my species, I think Calislasma rotostoma is still uh, one of the most impactful Um but then also the boom slang um, and the twig snake, actually. So the research that I've conducted there, highly, extremely pro-coagulant. Like, it's scary how fast they're able to clot plasma, although they do cause massive hemorrhaging. When you, when you break it down um, and you're only working on a very small amount, they are extremely fast at cl um, producing clots. So there could be a potential there for... Um, for some sort of heart medication but again it's a species that doesn't yield that much venom because it's a colubrid um, it's quite hard to, to get venom off regularly and so to, to do that sort of further research um, would take a very long time uh, for that to happen not, not because of the lack of venom but just from where we are information wise to where we want to be um yeah there'd have to be a real a real need for something like that but yeah i don't know it's a hard question i'd like to think all of my species but yeah reality that's not going to happen okay so we'll go on to a final question here i think this is quite a maybe hopefully an easier one to answer uh, so do you have a favorite species to study the venom of and if so why <laughs> okay, well, um, I mean, I've only seen a handful of these snakes that I study in real life, and that was only because I went to Europe and they were in private collections. Yeah. So I, um, I had favorites based on Google images and um, snakes that I would like to go and see in the wild. So one of my favorites was... Um, Protobothrops manchiensis, and that's because um, of what it looks like. It's such an incredibly beautiful snake. Um, where it's located, very uh, isolated region of China, but also its venom um, was actually quite surprising. Like that, that, that paper's actually been published. Um, it's titled Habu Coagulotoxicity. Um, published last year and yeah it was actually surprisingly I mean although it, it's classified as an anticoagulant species so it causes mass hemorrhaging um, compared to its other closely related species it's it was actually uh, quite a quite an interesting venom to to research the other species that I I like uh, that I, I enjoyed researching was the boom slang, the Dyspilitis typhus. It was such an exciting, uh, an exciting venom to work with. I suppose maybe because it was one of the first species I was working on on all the coagular toxicity assays that we were working with, and it was one of those species that was giving me really good results really quickly, um, and it was just working on everything, um, and also some interesting facts that I found out about the snake um, and then it's venom in, in, a, in a laboratory sense you know it, it doesn't require the calcium or the phospholipid to to do what it does whereas a lot of other snake species uh, venom they require those added cofactors to have the same effects um, so that was that was actually a really cool cool venom to, to work with and it's still giving me um, you know it's still giving me 
um, um, benefits from from that research as well. You know, I I gave a talk at a conference uh, at the end of last year about it, and I published that in 2017. So, yeah, it was a very exciting venom to work with. Um, I, I think I, I, I actually have other... a. I actually have a question that, that that's just come up from that. So with colubrid venom, the colubrid venoms that you've worked with, have you seen a major difference between how the colubrid venoms work compared to how uh, the viper or lapid venoms you've worked with work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's um, it's it's knowledge that is um, quite well well received from a research perspective. Um, the the different families of snakes venomous snakes have um, not venom that's similar but there there are certain toxins that are found in some venoms that aren't found in others so vipers don't have three finger toxins whereas colubrids and elapids do um, you don't have neurotoxins generally um, oh, this is very broadly speaking in um, actually no I won't say that because that's not true um, yeah, there, there is a vast difference in the way that these venoms react and behave and um, what they dominate, what they're dominated in. So whether they're dominated in neurotoxins or whether they're dominated in coagulotoxins toxins or myotoxins or cytotoxicity toxins um, or whether it's a big mixture of all of the above, there, there is um, quite, yeah, there is a, there is a large difference between, between them. Um, between my specific species, um, it, they they were generally anticoagulant or procoagulant. So all of my Asian pit vipers are, broadly speaking, anticoagulant. So they, they cause hemorrhaging, which is also somewhat common knowledge, but we don't know why. We don't know exactly how they're doing that. That's actually quite... It, it, it's quite interesting because we, we've had an episode that was released a couple of weeks ago on, on epistoglyphous snakes and on, on obviously uh, covering a few of the myths around uh, epistoglyphous snakes. And, and this is a question that actually came up after, after that episode that we tried to our best to explain, but obviously we've not worked with, with colubrid venoms against other, other genre of, of snake venoms, which, which you yeah. have. So it's kind of good to, to say to see what we were kind of saying is actually what you found. Obviously, we use yeah. a lot of the work that you've produced and other people have produced around that to, to answer that question, but it still makes a difference when it comes from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, the venom is somewhat a direct representative um, of where that snake species is existing. Um, it, it's... Like the evolutionary pressures on snake venom based on their ecology and their prey ecology and their diet and things like that um, is directly like it, it directly influences the venom and how it's produced so you'll have somewhat um, uh, faster acting venom on, on uh, in species that you know have um, large prey escape um, potential so species that are um you know living high up in tree canopies or in very um isolated desert regions you know that might only come across a prey item every so often or in caves or on rocky outcrops and things like that so it is very um yeah very it influences their venom a lot yeah it, it's quite interesting to see to see the differences in in venoms, as you say, for from animals in certain regions and, and such forth. So, um, I, I think we've been recording for just under two hours. So, I think um, that that's been a very very good episode. It's been very very insightful to hear your story and how you've got into into venomous research and and actually in how you didn't necessarily want to go into venomous research. It's just how you took an opportunity and have run with that opportunity and, and it's great to see how you've developed through and hear the story on how you developed through that and that, that i think that's that's very inspirational in itself uh, so i'd just like to say thank you so much for for agreeing to come on to the podcast yeah, and 
and talking to us. What was that, Tom? I was just saying thank you so much and uh, absolute best best luck with the rest of your um, PhD. It must be incredibly challenging, uh, as you from what you were saying earlier. Um, and we're just hugely honoured that you were able to take time out uh, uh, your very limited time available to come and have a chat with us. It's been fantastic. It, it really, really has. So, so thank you, thank you so much. And hopefully, this hopefully we can get your message to more people and and show that actually that there's opportunities for everybody in science. You've just got to take the opportunities when they arise. So, I'd just like to thank all the listeners as well. And uh, please remember that you can view or listen to our podcast on YouTube, Podbean, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and any of your preferred podcasting platforms. And I'd just like to say again, thank you so much, Jordan, for joining us today. And um, we'd just like to thank our listeners once more. So goodbye for now and speak to you all in the next episode.